Hello students, welcome to the online lecture class for week 6, second semester. Since this is our first online class, I request every one of you to turn off your microphone and camera. Today's lecture is all about computer security. Computer security or cyber security or information technology security, IT security is the protection of computer systems and networks from the theft or damage to their hardware, software or electronic data, as well as from the disruption or misdirection of the services that they provide. Private information, company secrets, financial data, computer equipment and items of national security are at risk if proper security procedures are not followed. The objectives of today's lectures are explain why security is important, describe security threats, identify security procedures, identify common preventive maintenance techniques, and troubleshoot security. So let's start. Why security is important? Computer security is important because it keeps your information protected. It's also important for your computer's overall health. Proper computer security helps prevent viruses and malware, which allows programs to run quicker and smoother. When any equipment is damaged, productivity decreases. It can cost the company time and money. Also, unauthorized access into the network can expose confidential information. That's why data and network security are always crucial. Security threats There are majorly two types of security threats, physical threats and data threats. Physical threats can cause the damage to computer systems, hardware and infrastructure. It may be the events or attacks that still damage or destroy equipment such as servers and switches. Data Threat Data threat can be any event or attacks that can remove, corrupt, deny access or allow access or steal information. Now for these kind of threats, there are different sources. First is internal threat. Internal threat refers to the risk of somebody from inside the company who could exploit a system in a way to cause damage or steal data. These kind of threats are particularly troubling as employees are expected to be trusted individuals that are granted extended privileges, which can easily be abused. The next one is external threat. External threats originate from outside the organization, especially from the environment in which the organization operates. These threats may be primarily physical threats, socio-economic threats, specific to the country's current social economic situation, network security threats, communication threats, or human threats like attackers, hackers, software, and legal threats. External threats can be unstructured or structured. Unstructured means attackers can use available resources such as passwords or scripts to gain access to the system. Structured external threat is the attackers can use the code to access operating system and softwares. So now let's look at different types of security threats. Viruses, worms and trojans. Viruses. Computer virus is a type of harmful program which is written with malicious intent by attackers. When virus is transferred to another computer through any medium, it also affects that computer. Viruses normally corrupt or delete the files in computer system. The another one is worms. Unlike viruses, worms are also malicious program which can replicate itself into the network. Like virus, Worm does not affect the data or application, but it is harmful to our network as it consumes bandwidth. 
Next one is Trojan. A Trojan horse or Trojan is a type of malicious code or software that looks legitimate but can take control of your computer. A Trojan is designed to damage, disrupt, steal or in general inflict. A Trojan acts like a genuine application or file to trick you. It seeks to trick you into loading and executing the malware on your device. Once you install a Trojan, it can perform any action which it was designed for. Next is Adware. Adware is unwanted software designed to throw advertisements up on your screen, most of all within a web browser. Adware pops off windows are difficult to control and opens new windows faster than users can close them. Here on the example you can see an advertisement that is showing the message of congratulations you have won the desktop computer and also it is asking user to download a software that is an adware. Next is Grayware or Malware. Grayware or malware is a file or program that is potentially harmful. Many grayware attacks are phishing attacks where users are persuaded to provide their credentials. It can be removed using spyware and adware removal tools. Spyware is similar to adware that is distributed without user's knowledge. Spyware monitors activity on the computer and sends the information to the attacker who developed it. Here you can see the example of an advertisement that is showing the message of congratulations you have won the hourly contest and also it is asking user to click to claim the prize. Once the user will click the button then it will install a spyware program in the background which will monitor the activity of users like browsing history and send it to the attack. Next one we have phishing. Phishing is a form of social engineering where the attacker pretends to represent a legitimate outside organization such as bank. A potential victim is contacted via email. For security, you should use the postal service to share sensitive information in order to get protected from phishing attack. In this image, the attacker pretends to be from Amazon management, which is actually a phishing attack to get the all information of users from the attached link. Next attack is denial of service. Denial of service is a type of attack that restricts the authenticated user from accessing normal services such as web server. The attacker sends many requests that keeps system occupied and the system cannot respond to authenticate user. Similarly, we have distributed denial of service, which is similar to denial of service attack, only that distributed denial of service has many number of attackers, also called botnet, that are performing attack from different part of the world. The major objective is to obstruct or overwhelm access to the targeted server and prevent that particular target server to respond to the authenticate user request. Here on the figure you can see an example of DOS attack. Next we have spam and pop-up windows. Spam which is also known as junk mail, is a unsolicited mail commonly used as a method of advertising. These links can result in lots of windows designed to grab your attention and lead you to advert sites. These windows are called pop-ups. Many IDVirus programs and email software programs automatically detect and remove spam from an email inbox. For verifying an either an email is a spam email or not a spam email, 
you should check for the following factor. If the email that you get has no subject lines, then it might be a spam mail. Check out the email header and check out signed by an encryption tab. And if that tab does not contain um, proper information, it might be an spam email. Check out email address. For example, if you see an email coming from Amazon and when you check on the mail, the email is from different domain, that might be an spam. Computer generated emails. Google warnings. On today's uh, mail feature, Google also wants either might be the um, received mail is an spam mail. So if you receive such type of warning, then that kind of mail may be a spam email. Today, automatically Google has a spam folder for such kind of spam emails. Next is social engineering. A social engineer is a person who is able to gain access to equipment or a network by tricking people into providing the necessary access information. They gain confidence of an employee and convinces them to disclose their username and password information. Basic precautions that can be done to be safe from social engineering are Never give out your password. Always ask for the ID of unknown person. Restrict access of unexpected visitors. Escort all visitors. That means you need to be with the visitors if there are unknown visitors or unexpected visitors on your premises. You should never post your password in your work area. If you post it, someone else might use that password to get the access to your system and put you in a big trouble. You should lock your computer when you leave your desk, otherwise any unauthorized person or your employees, colleagues might steal the information that is vital to your company and organization. You should not let anyone follow you through the door that requires an access card. Next slide demonstrates and explains all the TCPIP attacks, major TCPIP attacks. The first type of attack is a sync flood attack. Sync flood is nothing but a synchronization packet that is done on three way handshaking process of TCPIP protocol. A sync flood is a form of denial of service attack in which an attacker sends a succession of synchronization requests to a target's system such that in an attempt to consume enough server resources to make the system unresponsive to legitimate traffic. Reply attack In reply attack, different kind of network stifers tools can be used to extract user names and passwords that is to be used later date to gain access. Network Sniffer is a tool that monitors or snipes the data following over computer network link in real time, such like Wireshark. The next type of attack that is inside the TCP IP is DNS poisoning. In DNS poisoning, the major target of attacker is DNS records. In DNS record, the attacker changes the DNS record on the system such that the new DNS record will point to the false servers where the data is recorded. The another type of attack is spoofing. In spoofing, the attacker gains access to resources on devices by pretending to be a trusted computer. Man in the middle attack. A man in the middle attack is attack in which an attacker intercepts the communication between two hosts either to secretly eavesdrop or insert false information 
in traffic traveling between the two posts. Attackers might use man in the middle attacks to steal login credentials or personal information. Also spy on the victim or sabotage communications or to corrupt data. Next one we have is data wiping, hard drive destruction and recycling. These are the method of wiping out or clearing out the data from unused hard drives. Data wiping, hard drive destruction and recycling. These are the methods of disposing of hard drives that might contain the sensitive information. Data wiping is the method of permanently deleting the files. Clearing the data might not be enough as it can be recovered easily. So hard drives are hammered and destroyed completely using shredding machines. A drive that does not contain sensitive data can be cleared, formatted and which can be reused in any other computers as well. So next slide contains security procedures. The first thing in security procedures is always a security policy. Security policy is nothing but it's a documentation or report made by organization body. A security policy is a written document in an organization which outlines how to protect the organization from threats including computer security threats and how to handle situations when they occur. A security policy must be, answer, must be able to answer different questions. First question, what assets require protection? So the assets should be prioritized. Which asset has the highest importance and which has the least? Here, assets can be any physical equipment or any kind of data. What are the possible threats to the organization? What are the possible types of attacks that can be made to our system? And on such situation, what we should do or what action should be performed in the case of security breach. So security policy must be maintained to be able to answer such kind of questions. Security policy should be reviewed and updated regularly with proper password guidelines. Here password guideline means while any of the employee or any of the system is assigned a password what kind of strong features should be used inside the password? Maybe the password must contain the alphabet from small letters and capital letters, special characters, you know, symbols, um, numerical values and such. So a password guideline must be fixed. Definition to employees should be given while accessing public or top secret confidential data. So security policy is the first measure in security procedures. So now let's talk about the protection of physical equipment. Physical security is equally important as data security. There are some of the physical equipment protection methods that can be implemented on our organization premises. The first thing is control access to facilities. So each of the department must have a control access to its employees or only to authorized person. Use cable locks with equipment. We need to also keep our telecommunication rooms locked. Fit equipment with security screws so that it cannot be easily broken. We should use security cages around the equipment. We should also label and install sensors such as RFID tag on equipment. Here RFID means radio frequency identification device which is our 
ID system that uses a small radio frequency identification device for identification and tracking purposes of employees. We should also install physical alarms that can be triggered by motion detector sensors. We can also use web cameras with motion detection features and surveillance software that can always monitor the event that is happening on its surrounding and record it so that any of the security officials can view the recorded or recorded video in case of any security attacks. We can also use card keys, biometric securities, also we can also use security guards with armed weapons and different types of sensors for protecting our physical equipments. Let, now let's talk about data protection. Data are always very critical. Data can data protection features are like bias password protection, where user can enable bias password to prevent any unauthorized person from changing the BIOS setting. BIOS passwords can be configured from BIOS itself. So from the next time, if anyone tries to log in into the BIOS, the BIOS password must be entered. Another password is user login password, which prevents unauthorized access to the local computer and the network. Data encryption. Encryption is the process of changing the plain text data into unreadable format. There are a lot of encryption algorithms that does the same, that they change the data from plain text into the cipher text using different types of keys. Traffic between resources and computers on the network can be protected from attackers by implementing encryption. So we can also use virtual private network that is our dedicated tunnel network from uh, client to the system or to the network which also helps in production of our data. Software firewalls or hardware firewalls can also be implemented for data protection. A firewall is simply a program or hardware device that runs on a computer that allow or deny traffic and filters the information coming through the internet connection into your private network or computer system. Firewall contains different inbound or outbound rules. We will be implementing firewalls on our upcoming lab sessions on Windows operating system. Similarly, hardware firewalls can also be implemented on our network which contains different types of security rules which is defined by network admin or security admin. So the incoming traffic or outgoing traffic must agree upon that rules. If that does not agree on the rule, those kind of traffics can be allowed or denied on entering the network. So on the next slide, we will be looking at different types of ways to protect our data. The first is data backup. Data backup is a critical process that we need to perform on a weekly or daily or monthly basis. Backing up data is one of the most effective ways of protecting against data loss. After we finish the data backup, the backed up data must be stored in any off-site location not on the premise of our own network, but in off-site location, that means on in different location, and protect it with a strong password. The backed up data must be available at any time. The data backup must be a unit data. That means the complete data set should be there. With incomplete data backup, companies might also get in loss. 
smart card security uh, can be a way to implement to protect our data. A smart card is nothing but a physical card that can be uh, implemented on our system. It has an embedded integrated chip that acts, acts as a security token. Smart cards are typically the same size as a driver's license or credit card and can be made out of a metal or plastic. Smart cards provide authentication and encryption to keep data safe. Next one is biometric security. Biometric security uses physical characteristics of a person like fingerprint, handprint, eye pattern recognition, facial recognition to authenticate peoples. Biometric security are getting popular for controlling access to the physical systems and data. Next one is file system. In the previous lecture, we have already discussed about different file systems and differences between them on operating system. Normally using NDFS file system, new technology file system enables users to implement file encryption that makes data more secure. So NDFS file system or the latest file system must be implemented on our system. Now let's talk about Wi-Fi security techniques. There are a lot of measures to secure your Wi-Fi network or wireless network. Some of them are listed on the slide. The first one is modify the default SSID service set identifier. This means change your Wi-Fi name. Set up separate wireless LAN or VLAN. VLAN is nothing but a virtual local area network that can make your LAN separated inside the departments. You should use strong encryption. For right now, we have advanced encryption standard that is more secure than the older encryption method like TKIP. You should deploy mutual authentication between the client and the network like two-factor authentication. Two-factor authentication can be used, also used on emails, can be used on Facebooks, Instagrams or different social medias to verify or to make your security credentials more strong. In this mm, way, in two-factor authentication or multi-factor authentication, when you insert the password, you receive a OTP code on your phone and that OTP code must be entered only to get access on the site. You can also use VPNs or WEP wired equivalent privacy combined with MAC address filters to secure business specific devices only in the case if your Wi-Fi network or wireless network does not support WPA or WPA2. MAC address filtering is a process inside a router's admin panel where you can insert the MAC address of your devices. If the list is whitelist, then the MAC address that you entered will only get access. And if the list in the MAC address filtering is a blacklist, in that case, the MAC address you entered only will not get access to the network. So you have an option. Either you can choose whitelist or you can choose blacklist. Similarly, next step is to deploy a lightweight access point architecture that does not store security information locally. Like we can implement a radius server. A radius server is a type of server which only stores the login credentials and is only responsible so for verifying and authenticating such login credentials that is connected remotely. Ensure management ports are secured. So, Ports are nothing but a virtual connections on our system for different types of protocols. So if we are using any protocols, we need to make sure that particular port is secure. And if we, if we are not using any kind of services, we must make sure that ports are closed. 
physically hide or secure access points to prevent tampering. That means we can create a lock on access point. So next process is to update OS and installing security patches. Updating operating system and security patches can also help our system to make secure. Here we can create a restore point prior to installing an update because in case that update fails to provide the service, we can go back to our previous good configuration. We must check for updates to ensure that we have the latest one in case of our applications or in case of our operating system. We should download updates using automatic updates or from the operating system manufacturer's website. In this way, we can make sure that the update that we receive is from a genuine source. Install the update. Some of the updates might require restart or reboot the system. And at the end, we should make sure that the computer is operating smoothly. So these are the concepts on computer security. At the end, if we have to troubleshoot any problem related to security, these are the security troubleshooting steps. The first process is to identify the problem, what kind of security threats we have. Second is to establish a theory of probable causes. In this step, we should determine the cause of threat or we should list out the possible causes on that particular problem. The third step is to determine an exact cause. For this, we can test for every theory that we have established on process number 2. If we determine an exact cause, we should go into the solution implementation. If we cannot determine an exact cause, we should again go to step number 2. After implementing a solution, we need to verify either the implemented solution is working fine or not and if we have now such kind of problems in our system or not. So verify the system functionality fully. And at the end, document findings. So in this step, we should document the steps that we made to solve the problem the documentation or the website that we used as a reference to solve this problem, the time taken, the cost taken or any hardware resources or any software resources used to solve that particular pro problem. In this way, troubleshooting can be made properly. With this, we came to an end of the lecture. If you have any questions, you can leave a private comment in the classroom post that is created for answering the questions immediately. Thank you very much. Goodbye. Have a nice day.